welcome to the Learning with Little Show. You know, check us out anywhere there are podcasts, YouTube, you name it. And I just wanted to let you guys know quickly, what is this show about? Where are you going to get from it? Research has shown that about half of people go on to listen to podcasts because they want to learn something and another half want to be entertained while, be, you know, learning something. With this show, I want it to be fun, you know, for me and the guest and for people listening in. So there's generally a lot of laughs, there's a lot of fun, but the ultimate goal is for everyone to take something away from these calls, these interviews, whether it's just like a factoid, whether it's a story, whether it's something that they can apply to their life. And at the same time, get to know someone new. You know, each guest is doing something really fantastic. And so listening in, you get to learn about them. And so you definitely check that box for, you know, learning something new and for entertainment, try my best to make it fun for the guests and myself and hopefully for you guys as well. But that's really the goal of each episode be 50% learning and 50% fun. Today we're joined with Bill Kramer. He is an international recognized leader in emergency planning, training, disaster management. He served in the Marine Corps, fire department. He's done it all. Um, so in today's episode, we're going to discuss, you know, space, fire safety, emergency management, aliens, uh, and a number of these issues. And we talk about technology that's coming out to help with wildfires. So if you're in California, you kind of curious about what's going on in California. This is a good episode to kind of hear about that. But for the most part, we get to hear about Bill. We get to hear about his life. We get to hear about the cool, great things that he has done. And we also get to learn about fire safety and all the things I just mentioned. So without further ado, let's get into this. So there's there's tons of fires going on and uh, the news is covering it like the news normally does, which is just like emphasizing the negatives and just, you know, kind of letting people know, like to stay out of the way. But I'm curious as someone who's an expert in this field, um, disaster management, fire safety, uh, what, at, for this, just looking at this year, have there been particular highs and lows as you've seen people respond to it where you're like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm really proud that we responded to it that way or well, we could have done that better that you think about as you look back on it? We are uh, always trying to learn from past events so that the next similar event will be handled in a, in a better, more professional way. But the magnitude of the fires out there seem to be outracing even the best of intentions. We, uh, uh, we did set a record out west for the largest fire ever recorded. We've set some records on the daily temperatures, which are help contributing to the continual spread of these fires. And the resources to fight such a fire are completely overpowered at times by the fire itself. And uh, it's just a matter of survival, surround and drown. Now, that if we talk about building fires, we're talking about a pretty limited area. Even the largest buildings have beginnings and ends and perimeters where we can surround and protect the exposures and it will actually work our way in. But with these wildfires, they, even when they have a defined area, sometimes firebrands will leap several miles and then reignite other fires miles away. So even finding the perimeter is difficult in these large fires. And that's why it's so difficult to bring resources to bear. Now, a lot of people say, well, what about aerial, <clears throat> aerial surveillance? Well, you got to realize with these high heat currents, it makes it difficult to keep stability in the air above the, the danger zone. And when these planes are trying to to discharge fire retardant, fire chemicals and or water, it's uh, they have to kind of work the perimeter. And actually in a building fire, we always say, let's go from the unburned area. If it's a house fire and the house is in the bedroom, the fire, the, the fire, excuse me, is in the bedroom. We try to work from outside the bedroom, confine the fire so that we do not push the fire into unburned areas. The same thing on a larger scale is what we're trying to do with these wildfires out west by bringing resources around the perimeter. If And I already described how difficult that perimeter can be to define, mm -hmm. but where we can define it and where we can think we can do some good, we try to bring resources there, concentrate on extinguishing and protecting buildings. Now, there are some new things. There are some, there are some uh, gels that are being used now that can coat buildings ahead of a fire and keep the fire from actually catching even a combustible wooden structure on fire. The, the gels were developed, and there's one called, uh, called Barricade. It was actually developed from diapers 
created by Procter and Gamble. The uh, we one fire, John Bartlett belonged to the Jupiter Fire Department in Florida. They had a pretty serious fire, but they found some white material that was completely unburned, and they were trying to figure out what it was. And it turned out it was uh, some disposable diapers that the absorbent power that was created by these diapers was amazing and it was soaking up water and they created a a gel a liquid that could be educted into a hose line and squirted and coated on a building so that the absorbing power of the heat was amazing and it actually uh, and where they were able to use this in certain structures even the even some of the hottest wildfires would bypass a building once it was coated with this. Mm-hmm. So in other words, uh, that gave the fire departments a new a new weapon that they didn't have before. Instead of hand hand uh, standing in one location and protecting one building with fire hoses, they could coat the building with this so-called diaper gel. It's called barricade. It's on the market now and being used. Uh, pretty extensively as an edit. They could go ahead and coat a building with a diaper gel, which was like putting a water coating that would stay in place. And the layers of these polymers could burn off as the heat approached and leaving the building intact. Then they could go on to another building and another building. And they're somewhat limited. You would have to have enough product. But it did extend considerably the ability of one fire crew to protect numerous homes, perhaps as many as five or six instead of just one. And that has been one of several technological advances that have come, come, come about in the last decade or so that does allow us to do some things with these wildfires that we weren't able to do before. Outside of Barricade, are there other technologies that you're equally excited about in terms of the application to helping people? There seems to be drones everywhere we look and they are being applied by the emergency services for various purposes including surveillance we just talked about wildfires and one of the big advantages we have now is the ability to send up un- unarmed unmanned little drones which can record the progress of a fire and allow optimal utilization of limited air resources in terms of fire suppression so even if the fires get bigger, it means we can control a larger fire with uh, the same number of resources due to our advanced ability now, now through drone technology to predict the travel and the behavior patterns of a given fire. So all of that is really good. And we're, we're in good shape now in, uh, in terms of utilizing a combination of ground forces, aerial forces, There were a lot of old tried and true techniques, which aren't so good anymore. And we used to talk about smoke jumpers and they're still available. They still work for limited small wildfires where firefighters will actually parachute in behind the fire line to dig their way in and create fire barriers, primarily by eliminating a strip of fuel. Now, uh, sometimes it's unpredictable which direction the wind is going to blow. And that creates havoc sometimes with these man-made hard labor type of fire lines that are created by the smoke jumpers. So we're, we're rethinking some of that technology, coming up with some new ways. And now we're combining some resources so that if we have available to us aerial aircraft, which can reload and redistribute water drops, in conjunction with these fire lines, that seems to be the best way to actually stop the spread of a given wildfire. There was a term that the fire service has used probably for about the last 20 years called wildland urban interface. And that's where the the wild forest meets the population areas. There are occasionally cabins and homes built far into the forest by individuals here and there. But essentially, when we talk about a subdivision that that butts up against a wildfire zone, we're talking uh, the wildland urban interface area. 
-hmm. And one of the greatest safety measures is the ability to take away combustible fuel. The, the vegetation around homes can be pared way back and cut back. And that seems to be one technique that will work. Now, many, many private homes do have pools and some homeowners have developed the idea that I'm going to protect my own home with the water in my own pool. And they can actually uh, have a portable pump connected to a, a fire hose, more so than a garden hose, a little, little more volume. And there's been some limited success. Now, the fire service does not advocate that. When an evacuation order is given, uh, there is a temptation among many people to stay and fight and, and uh, figure I can be safe. I can jump in my pool if I have to. But uh, that's not really recommended. Of course, if you're going to use all the water in your pool to try to protect your home, then you obviously have given up the ability to use it as a haven. But even, even people in pools find that the water heats and it's not very comfortable and, and they, they feel lucky to survive some of those situations. So those are just some of the nuances of wildfire. Uh, the, uh, the fires are getting bigger. The technology is advancing to keep pace with the growth in these wildfires. And hopefully mankind will, will continue to maintain the upper hand. And ultimately they all do seem to be contained and controlled, often with the help of nature. Rainfall is often welcome and a dying down of the winds in a given area is a big help in allowing firefighters to control these massive fires out west. Is there, or how can uh, like the people in the areas and the local governments, is there anything that they can do to do a better job in combating the disasters so just on an individual level? I think I've, I've hit on one thing that is uh, it, it's good and that would be ordinances that require the clearing of vegetation within say a hundred yards of an inhabited structure. The, uh, so that the, the fuel is taken away. Mm -hmm. All the way back to my Boy Scout days, we talked about the, the three requirements for a fire to exist. Heat, fuel, and air. Uh, if you want to be real technical, there's an uninhibited chain reaction, which creates a fourth event. But if, essentially, you can ignore that because the other three alone are enough to understand what it takes to have a fire and what it takes to extinguish a fire. Heat, air, and fuel. So if you take away the fuel... Even if you have the heat from the, and you have the air and the wind currents, it's not going to catch your house on fire if there's not a connecting fuel link to the fire as it advances. So I think that in terms of what governments can do, local ordinances that re rigorously enforce these codes to eliminate vegetation in the vicinity of homes, especially in the urban urban interface area, wildland urban interface areas where the fires are most likely to come from a wildfire source into an inhabited area. That is just one thing. Certainly the fire services like to have more staffing, more equipment, etc. Another thing the local governments can do is make sure they have not only mutual aid agreements with adjacent jurisdictions, but regional mutual aid agreements, interstate agreements, so that questions like the ability of workers comp in one state to cover firefighters if they agree to transfer into another state to fight fire, those things can all be ironed out in advance. And we're seeing more and more of that so that the resources in any given area may come from many states further, further away on a national, on a national network. There is, on a similar vein, we often hear about these urban search and rescue teams so that when there is a natural disaster, like an earthquake in a certain part of our country or a massive hurricane, any, any chance where there are opportunities to rescue trapped residents from buildings. The, uh, the recent collapse in Florida was, mm -hmm. was noted a while back where many Residents, unfortunately, 
were lost in the building, but it wasn't for lack of the resources to try to get those people out. The urban search and rescue teams from around the country were brought to bear on that incident with a certain amount of success and a certain amount of saves that, that could be made. So that, that idea of using our whole country and the federal government has been involved. The FEMA group, the Federal Emergency Management Agency has been instrumental in organizing and equipping these regional teams with specialized rescue equipment. They can usually be mobilized rather quickly and they can usually be brought to bear in other, other parts of the country as necessary. Mm -hmm. Are there, um, I'm curious where you go to get the news and as un, an unbiased way as possible. Is there like a, a good place to read up on, on developments like this? Well, there are, uh, uh, the, the FEMA has a website where mm -hmm. they talk about opportunities for various classes that are being they're being offered various organizational networks that they are sponsoring or creating. So uh, I, I do like to use the FEMA network. It, it also ties into something else, which is the National Fire Academy. Emmitsburg, Maryland has a National Fire Academy, somewhat like the FBI Academy, which is one of the premier law enforcement institutions, accepts not only their own their own members, but they, they sponsor various classes for law enforcement officials. The National Fire Academy in Emmitsburg has, has done great things towards standardizing the bodies of knowledge necessary. One of the programs I was involved with very early was the development of a national network for baccalaureate degrees for firefighters, many of whom were having trouble meeting traditional college degree program requirements because of the irregular work schedule. Most college courses meet or used to meet at least a certain night of the week, every week the same, whereas firefighters on a rotating schedule couldn't have that same day off every week. So we, uh, we came up before there was ever an internet or any ability to do remote learning. We developed, we being the uh, National Fire Academy, a a fully accredited baccalaureate degree program for firefighters and allowed them to get their education. That program is alive and well today. And there are standardized bodies of knowledge, the standardized curriculum so that firefighters everywhere get the same quality courses that are developed nationally. Mm -hmm. And now certain, certain parts of the country have their own special needs. If you're in a coastal area, water rescue and, and hurricane preparation or subjects that you probably wouldn't need in Iowa. So there are, there are variations, but the standardized knowledge of knowledge in terms of uh, extinguishing building fires, preventing fires, disaster preparation of all sorts, those, those standardized bodies of knowledge, fire prevention efforts, arson investigation, and, and management, organizational structuring. Uh, fire departments are, are having to make some transitions today. For many, many years, vast majority land-wise, the footprint-wise in the United States was protected by volunteer fire departments. Today, it's getting difficult to recruit and retain volunteer firefighters. Yeah. The standards imposed by the states are rather demanding in terms of time needed to get certifications so that you can legally serve as a volunteer firefighter with at least some minimal training that will allow you to do, do the job well and keep you and your colleagues safe on the fire ground. Those are becoming difficult. Plus, there's more and more competition from family activities that and some, some need in many cases to work extra jobs that do not allow volunteer firefighters the luxury of time that they used to have to devote to the fire service agency that they volunteered for. Those are some of the some of the issues, and how have the nation, nation's fire departments coped with that? In some cases, they've they've come up with automatic assistance agreements, where adjacent fire departments automatically, at the sound of a fire alarm, respond to one another's territories. <clears throat> so anyway, we have these these shared resource agreements between adjacent communities. 
This is often facilitated by new regional dispatch centers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the new regional dispatch centers that are commonplace in many parts of the country now, as opposed to individual communities handling their own 911 calls for service. These regional communication centers allow not only calls to come in from a wider geographical area, but allow immediate dispatching of multiple agencies to bring to bear on serious incidents such as a, a multi-vehicle car crash or a building fire or some other, some other serious emergency incident that's going to require more than a single agency to handle. So that way, if, if we used to have numerous volunteer fire departments, each with a roster of 50 people, and now we have the same area fire departments with a roster of 15 instead of 50, then if we can get three fire departments to co-respond, we have almost the same number of people to bring to bear. And with some improvement in equipment and technology, the shared services between adjacent departments is now helping compensate for the lack of volunteer personnel in some of the rosters. But it's not an easy task. It, this task of staffing fire departments where there are no volunteers and there is no funding for paid personnel creates a real squeeze and a real dilemma that has caused some creativity. There are some parts of the country where there simply is no real fire service. The volunteers have gone away there is no tax base to support a fire department and uh, people pretty much have to self-insure because the cost of fire insurance is extremely high in those areas. Now that's a very small part of the country, but at one point there was no such thing as a agency, an agency less community being a fire department agency. There was always somebody there somehow that could get get some fire equipment to bear. Not always the case now. For, and I, I do think that the federal government is working hard to try to fill those gaps. There are various grants put out every year. S-A-F-E-R, SAFER, is an acronym for a national grant that allows paid departments of all sizes to apply for federal money to pay for on-duty personnel. They have recently broadened the scope of these safer grants to pay for volunteer incentives and incentives for part-time people. And many departments are finding that this is helpful now utilizing these grants or other forms of, of, uh, of income and new new income streams to allow them to start putting some people on duty now to, to get fire equipment on the road in the, whereas in the past, these same departments maybe were totally reliant on volunteers, which are becoming fewer in number now. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, just, uh, just in terms of time, is this like something that's happened in the last like five years or when, it, when, did, when did you notice that shift? Mm -hmm. I think it's, I, I've noticed it as far back as uh, 25 years wow. when <clears throat> the, the Ham, Hamlin County, Ohio, which surrounds the city and includes the city of Cincinnati, has about 41 different fire departments. Virtually all but the city of Cincinnati and two other cities, city of Norwood, city of St. Bernard, those three cities within Hamilton County had on-duty paid personnel, but virtually all the other departments, all the other 41 departments were relying on volunteers. And as of now, there are only two volunteer fire departments out of those 41. The other 39 have all found ways to put some on-duty personnel. There has, ha there has been some combination of of departments over the years, but so that, that's been going on. And usually it starts off with, during the day when most volunteer firefighters are at a full-time job away from the community, not in proximity to the fire department, not available to respond, 
that happens usually daytime, weekday hours. So some fire departments would start by putting maybe a two-person crew paid on duty to bolster the daytime response and get something out the door in a hurry. Then I noticed many of these departments gradually increased that and they started doing perhaps weekend daytimes because many volunteers are busy weekday weekends doing other things, if not at their full-time job. Then they go to 24-hour staffing. And virtually all the departments now that surround the city of Cincinnati no longer have just some part-time hours covered, but they've all gone to some protection, except for those couple of volunteer departments I mentioned earlier. They've all gone to some sort of 24-hour protection in terms of people available. Some communities like Deer Park and Silverton, two, two adjacent cities, combined into one fire department, and it was a wonderful thing for both communities. They have a beautiful fire station they, they put on the border between the two, whereas neither community could afford on-duty full-time people. They now have on-duty full-time people that provide 24-hour paramedic service in addition to fire protection. So I think we're gonna see more of that in the future, more com combining of resources into, from various departments into a larger regional entity. I think we will see, uh, see more shared service agreements where if, even if they maintain their independence and their own identity, they will still start doing more interjurisdictional automatic response and softening of the borders is, is a term I like to use to describe how uh, we provide fire protection in most, most parts of the country today. Oh, that's awesome to hear that people are adapting and uh, you know, centralizing a little bit to make sure that we're still covering everyone that's need that needs help. Um, I'm, I'm curious as, as we transition to the second part of the conversation on you know UFOs and aviation. There was a, a story I heard that was related to to me by a mutual friend of ours, um, Ryan Menjes, who uh, told me that while you were working. Well, I guess I should ask, I, I'll just ask the question, and then maybe you, you'll just like tell us about it because it actually sounds pretty cool. Um, so uh, how did you redesign the operational safety of a uh, spaceport, uh, before the, one of the SpaceX rockets exploded, uh, that ended up saving lives? Like, uh, I, I was, I was hearing the story now. I, I think the listeners might enjoy it as well. And we can use that as a base to launch into, you know, uh, the need for safety in this area. Right. Well, uh... After I left the uh, city of Cincinnati as assistant fire chief, I was armed with a doctorate degree and two masters, and I was, uh, had a pretty much a choice to go where I wanted to be a fire chief. And I chose the nearby city of Indianapolis, which was only uh, 90, 90 miles from Cincinnati. And uh, I, I became the international airport fire chief, which is a smaller department, obviously. I went from uh, 26 fire stations in Cincinnati to a single airport station, but it was, it was a very, instead of protecting 250,000 Cincinnatians, I now found myself protecting 37 million passengers every year in Indianapolis, a small but necessary force on duty. So uh, <clears throat> that background, uh, led me to a, a consulting venture with NASA. They, they searched around the country looking for somebody with some aviation experience and some fire service knowledge. And I was selected to be their fire protection consultant. There's a, there's a beautiful launch facility out on the Maryland, Virginia border called Wallops, where we were going to launch, they, we, uh, private SpaceX was going to launch the Antares rocket to resupply the space station. And my job was to review the fire protection on the base, including the structures, the protection facilities, the, the hydrazine detection equipment used by the fire department for the space equipment and so on. And I got involved in that. And uh, I produced a, a re report in terms of what could be done to improve and better allocate the expenditures for fire protection at that base. It was probably a year after my study that they actually had an incident where a unmanned spacecraft exploded 
over over the base and uh, some of my recommendations did come into play with possibly can't say for sure but possibly uh, some savings in property and lives uh, for example we had a vigorous automatic interjurisdictional agreement between the base fire department and the surrounding fire departments in the civilian areas surrounding the base and that was strengthened said so there were a lot more resources were, were available than would have been otherwise to come to bear on that when flaming debris was hitting the water and the and the land area at the base. Uh, also, uh, we, we, we suggested the broadening of the safety perimeter in the ocean, which would have, which would have uh, probably kept possibly, I can't say for sure, but possibly kept some some boaters out of harm's way when we broaden that perimeter. So I, I don't, you never know for sure uh, how, how good these plans have helped or whether or not they saved anything. It's, mm -hmm. it's just like the old story about fire prevention. <clears throat> how, how well do you know you're preventing fires because no prevented fire has ever been, mm -hmm. ever been detected. Yeah. But uh, one thing along those lines, we can say, however, uh, we used to talk about how many fires are, are protected with smoke alarms. And we can do studies that said in 1984, this city enacted a smoke detector ordinance mandating hardwired battery backup alarms in each and every multifamily residence. And the annual average death rate from fires was X number. And after the smoke alarm ordinance, the average over the next 10 years dropped 70%. Now you can't say which fires were prevented or which lives were saved with the smoke detector ordinance, but the statistical data is there that you can make an argument that somebody's alive today and some property is saved today because of that ordinance, even though you could never identify specifically which, which, uh, which, which fires were prevented. <clears throat> That makes sense. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, as we talk about um, basically a, a spacecraft exploding, um, your thoughts on how, you know, emergency management systems or uh, should respond to, you know, UFO and related, you know, even like the known ones, you know, aircraft that, that uh, go down. Sure. Well, a lot of people treat the UFO subject tongue in cheek. As if, as if it uh, it's a space odyssey fantasy world and it really has no part in our real world. Uh, but I think that's a mistake. And I was glad to see that our our government recently said that well, we do have things up there that we cannot identify. But I think a lot of people lose sight of what, what this UFO means. It means unidentified flying object. It doesn't mean that it's from outer space. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that uh, it contains space aliens or, or beings from another universe or another planet. But what it does mean is something is unknown. And uh, we, when we, when Chuck Bain, deputy fire chief in Los Angeles, and I were asked by the National Fire Academy to prepare the textbook that was going to be used in the disaster planning course for many years. Chuck, who had been part of an advisory group to President Nixon regarding space affairs and was very knowledgeable about Project Blue Book, decided we should put something in this about response to unidentified flying objects. <clears throat> now, whether they exist or not, the fact that that, the, that people can perceive the existence of unidentified flying objects can some ways, uh, somehow, some way, create panic at times. And it's that panic incident that we really do need to be aware of. And therefore, it does make sense to include in an annex, in a disaster plan, how a fire department's gonna deal with the unanticipated panic that could occur in the event that uh, some un unidentified flying object materializes and or the uh, population 
becomes concerned and upset and panicky because of it. I think most people are aware of the Orson Welles broadcast on one Halloween evening that sent the world into a panic when it was an invasion of Martians that he was, and actually created some suicides there. A story of about a mother that took her children, jumped off of a large building because she thought suicide would be better than being captured by space aliens. So that the perceived existence of something can, can create panic. Another, another incident I'm familiar with is a religious sighting on, on a large oil storage tank in Cold Spring, Kentucky, not far from Cincinnati. The, emer the, the traffic jam was so bad for people wanting to go experience and see this unusual phenomenon that the fire equipment, emergency equipment was unable to reach several serious incidents because of the unexpected and Un unforeseen traffic jam. So whether the, whether there is such a thing as a alien craft, a UFO, and in, in the more commonly <clears throat> more commonly construed meaning, or whether or not, there's still always this this potential for panic that the emergency responders need to deal with. But uh, Chuck Bain, my co-author on this book, uh, went even further. And uh, he, he explained that uh, there were indeed uh, some credible sightings that go unexplained by astronauts, by various aviation experts. And a lot of this new information is, is being released. And uh, interestingly, and I'll, I'll just quote something here that dates back to 1969. Uh, Congress in, and I'm gonna quote, I've got the book in front of me with the chapter on, UFO potential. It says Congress in 1969 adopted a law, 14 CFR chapter five, part 1211, called extraterrestrial exposure. And this is in, in the Congress congressional law now, and it gives NASA the discretion to quarantine under armed guard any object, person, or other form of life which has been extraterrestrially exposed. So that there is some serious, uh, serious attention to what could happen, even though to date, as far as I know, we have, despite rumors to the contrary, we have no, no evidence to my knowledge that we have act actually witnessed any, any alien beings. There, there are some, some pretty strong stories and pretty good evidence that there are unexplained things like the Roswell, New Mexico incident and some others that uh, <clears throat> have most credible people believing that there, there's something there that's it's not, not from this world, but from somewhere else. Yeah, I think the, um, that the uh, War of the Worlds is an interesting example because at the end of the broadcast, it would say like, hey, this is fiction. <laughs> you know, but like by that point, like people were so, you know, up in arms about it that they weren't listening anymore. And so they were just reacting before they could hear that it was just a story of the damage. There were a lot, a lot of stories out west of these strange triangular boomerang shaped figures that couldn't be explained by anyone. And it turns out a few years later, the stealth bomber was uncovered. It was some of the early test flights of the stealth bomber. But those, those early sightings, which were unexplained because this craft is going faster than anybody could imagine, didn't look like a conventional aircraft, et cetera. That, that certainly created its, its fair share of panic and it turned out to be something of this world. Yeah, I think that's interesting. It's like uh, that. I think it's Arthur C. Clarke that said that any sufficient technology looks like magic to like a person who doesn't know what it is. So it's kind of, in, in that scenario, it's like, oh, we haven't seen that before. So then people jump. Um, so then, what would you recommend to um, people as they're, you know, paying attention to the skies more or what have you, as these uh, briefings and and information is getting declassified? Um, so they can stay away from like the serious point of view and more look at it like, a, I guess, like a scientist or like a, an engineer. Like how, how, how would you encourage people to 
look at these things? And is there anything that you would highlight that you suggest that they should look at? Sure. There are, uh, there, there are classifications. Uh, Dr. Uh, Heineck, Northern University professor emeritus of astronomy, astronomy, excuse me, was an advisor to the Air Force Blue Book Project. And I'm reading uh, his four-way breakdown. And these are the four types of unidentified flying objects or unidentified aerial phenomenon that, that, that he would categorize. His four categories are, number one, nocturnal lights. Now, there's not really a shape there, but there's unusual lights, either the speed, the color, or the duration. Somebody once told me they, they actually witnessed something with colors that were totally different than anything in our own electromagnetic spectrum that they had to be from another place. And, and I thought, well, I, I didn't necessarily believe that, but I, because I can't believe it. How could you recognize a color you have never seen before? But anyway, they, they, there are probably other types of, of lights, the speed, the configuration, et cetera. And the number two, that's, that's, so number one, nocturnal lights. Number two, daylight disks. That's the uh, stereotypical flying saucer. Number three, close encounters, day or night, or something you don't know necessarily the site, the, the shape, the size, but it was something that, that was a close encounter. And, and finally, number four, radar readings. And there are quite a few of these where a radar screen will pick up something and they will notify aircraft, military aircraft usually, of what they're seeing on radar and the, air, the aircraft Cannot cannot discern anything, so something's there picking up radar beams, but not visible to the uh, to the eyes of the pilots at least. So those are four categories. So if people are, get interested in this, there are some real credible, wonderful astronomy courses that deal with what's usual out there in the skies and what you can really look for. <clears throat> and uh, it's amazing most it, when we think. We are one small planet surrounding one star, which is a tiny part of our galaxy. And this galaxy is one of millions of galaxies. And according to most scientific research, many, many of these stars and many, many of these other galaxies certainly have planets orbiting them that are capable of life, like human life, or maybe something totally different, but some, some other form of life that we would never, not even recognize perhaps, might not even be visible to the human eye. And <clears throat> I, I like to think that uh, we've only scratched the surface, surface in our knowledge of what's out there beyond our, own, beyond our own planet, much less our own solar system. So uh, I, I would suggest that if somebody really gets into this, that go to a credible university online courses or in-person courses. With an astronomy course, it's one of those where you almost need some telescope time to, to profit from it. And uh, I personally was able to uh, take a seminar through the University of Cincinnati Com University program where we actually got to do some night viewing, got to see craters on the moon and got to see a lot of other things I would never have experienced without the advantage of that course. And uh, I think people can find those types of courses in a, any major metro area. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, also Coursera, and I think it's called EDX, I think Ed, Ed, Education X or something like that, where you can, um, you can even find them online, like get some of the, I take online courses all the time. I, it's a lot of fun. Um, so there's also those as well. Sure. Uh, have you, I've seen pictures of this, but I haven't seen it through a telescope, but have you seen the, the feet prints on the moon? Like I've seen the people take uh, telescope pictures, like a picture through their telescope, and you can actually see the feet of you know Neil Armstrong walking across the moon, or people driving around. And uh, I'm I'm not familiar with that, Lowell, but I imagine that has to be a wonderful experience just looking at those things. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's it's so beautiful, like the the contrast of the moon with just these little tiny, you know, you, you know, little tiny feet. And then like a, you know, rubber tracks, it's like just, it, and it's, it was like 60, 70 years ago or whatever, um, which is really neat to look at, but yeah, uh, I'll, I'll add show, uh, links to, the, uh, to that image in the show notes for people who haven't seen that. It's really cool. Um, are, are there, uh, is there like an unidentified phenomenon, 
you know, uh, object or what have you that you would be most like that you're like, man, I, I, I hope a uh, scientist figures this one out. Like, I'm really, you know, you, you follow it. You're very curious about it. And you, you, you want to learn more to get to the point where it's no longer unidentified, you know, it's a, an identified flying object, or whatever it is. It's not so much an object, but the thing I find most fascinating and most unexplainable is the sudden 90 degree turns by some of these light objects in the sky. And there's, Quite a, quite a bit of footage that's been captured by people of all, all in all parts of the country and people of all levels of credibility from very, very credible to, to perhaps a few, few wonders, have, <clears throat> wonder, uh, wondering people and then everything in between, people figuring out what is this? But when, when these speeding lights, the, and they suddenly do a 90 degree turn it's uh, it's something that I, I can't explain with anything I'm familiar with that, that we put in the air. So perhaps that that would be, to me personally, a great thing to have explained somehow to me someday. I, I agree that that's that's one of the ones that are particularly weird to me as well, because if it's a if it's a living thing, given the speeds that they go at like that, like if it was a human to be dead like that, to go so fast and then take a right angle like the inertia would just, you know, the G forces would probably be so intense that. It would kill whatever living creature was in there. So it's, if, it's, it's yeah, really weird. If it's a living creature similar to we on Earth. Yeah. Similar to us, because it's uh, <laughs> it could be some other type of life that uh, thrives on uh, G-forces. Hmm. That'd right. be interesting. Kind of like uses the G-forces as some type of like a centripetal force generation for energy. Yeah, we, you have to let, let your imagination doing this stuff and you're, you're i think someday people will find out mm -hmm. well we weren't far off when i was a child we talked about the day when we could get on a, a talking telephone with a face on the other side and uh, now sure enough we have facetime if somebody wants to see a person at the other end of a phone live we have that capability which seems so far away and so impossible so many not that many years ago mm -hmm. and uh nature's weird too like there's a i think it's a, a type of grasshopper where the like a, a part of their body literally looks like a gear like a, a gear that we would build and it basically like clicks and then they jump with it and it's just so strong that just naturally has evolved to look like a gear that we would engineer uh, so like you know nature can make the weirdest things um yes. so uh my last few questions i like to ask everyone um are you know are is there do you have books that you'd recommend people check out so uh most a lot of the listeners like to read or at least for at least uh, accommodate all the times so i uh, ask people for books and check them out and let me know how, how they like them so what uh what books would you recommend it could be in this field it could be just the things that you love sure well the, the the one textbook that covers all sorts of natural disasters, including UFO potential, is highly sought after on the web now. And these, these books are, uh, they're obsolete in a way, date-wise, but because it's one of the few books that ever included in a serious way, how to deal with UFOs, is the Fire Officer's Guide to Disaster Control by Kramer and Baim, B-A-H-M-E. Kramer with a K as in Seinfeld. So uh, the uh, that's a good book for somebody that wants to follow up on some serious discussion about emergency services and real and, and a real threat posed by the uh, not whether the UFOs are real or not posed by the potential for mass panic that that we do do have to deal with in emergency services. There are uh, there are other other good books. Uh, that, that book is your book, right? That that was one that I did, yes. And yeah, there's yeah. a newer version, newer version of that book called Disaster Planning and Control. And uh, the, the editors, uh, Penwell Publishing, that published the, the first book, decided not to do anything on UFOs and because uh, so many people were still treating it as tongue-in-cheek. And even though we preface that chapter by saying 
whether UFOs exist or not, the, the potential for mass panic by perceived unusual phenomenon, either aerial or otherwise, is very real and should be addressed by modern services. But I am, I am pleased to know that there are fire departments around the country and some have uh, shown up in various documentaries that have adopted an annex as part of their disaster planning on how to deal with mass panic from UFOs or from other unexplained phenomenon that could occur in their in their own jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, uh, uh, second to last question is: uh, Is there something that you uh, it could be a problem? It could be anything that you'd love people's help with, or is there a problem in the world that you'd like to point people at to get them to you know help them resolve the problem? So, is either personally, do you have something going on, or is there something in the world that you'd love people to you know put their shoulder against? Well, I. I we touched on it in this program, and that's the, the lack of fire and medical protection, emergency protection in some communities where the volunteers are disappearing and there is no funding to pay people. There are things people can do to, to assist their own communities and help their fellow man. They can, we, maybe we can rejuvenate some of, that, some of that volunteer spirit. And what I would like to see some of the states do is relax some of these very onerous training mandates that are so time consuming, they discourage volunteer firefighters. Many, many people would be willing to answer the call when the, when the alarm goes off in their community as a volunteer, but to be uh, obligated to do hours of, of training every week is something they just can't work into their schedule. So I would think that we, we could have maybe a dual system where we have a fully certified, trained interior firefighters. And then we have an auxiliary crew. There are so many things that can be done outside a burning building that do not require a lot of training and certification. Things like stretching hose lines, uh, placing portable ladders against the building, getting tools to the front door, setting up a, an exhaust fan. Many, many things can be done with, with, with not a lot of training and without a lot of danger to people because they would not be required to enter burning structures. So if we could have combination departments that would include enough interior firefighters fully certified to, to go in with hose lines while others auxiliary force outside, we might be able to rejuvenate the National Volunteer Fire Service to the extent that we'll get uh, many more decades of, of service out of these, out of these great civic minded people that do serve. Mm -hmm. Is there, um, is there like a, a, a website that is uh, geared towards, you know, trying to push that uh, agenda forward? Or is it just like they should write to the congressman? Is there like a good way for people to do that? There is a, a website, uh, national volunteer fire council, mm. and, uh, people can, can find that, uh, just by, uh, Googling, volunteer fire service and, okay. and uh there are there are there are some departments that are even locally trying to do things like that now but i do think it needs the blessings of a uh, of the states the state training is is being handled state by state and the training requirements to serve in departments both fire and paramedic emt emergency medical technician certification those are all pretty much uh, still the prerogative of the state to decide what the standards are and what the what the requirements would be for say a dual type certification process for for fire and uh i think i think it can be done uh, i do think people who would be interested in pursuing that and people in the unprotected communities where as i mentioned some places there are no more volunteers and there is no funding to pay on-duty firefighters, uh, I think that they would benefit most from by, by looking into that and pursuing it. And I think on the uh, local level is where we most likely get, get some success. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Then the last question is, and you, you kind of answered this, uh, a variant of this question earlier, but the, the question I always like to end with is, uh, what is a question that you have that you do not have the answer to that if someone listening in had the answer, you'd love 
to hear from them. Uh, kind of like it's like a small call to action at the same time. Just, uh, you know, you spent this entire time at, at answering questions. It's always kind of fun to leave with a question for the audience. And, and this would be uh, something I'd like to get an answer to myself. Yeah. If somebody could only tell me X, what would their what would their uh, what would their answer be? OK. Uh, my, my question to the audience would be. Uh, would would you be willing to encourage your children, male and female, into a life of uh, fire service work? I remember the reason I asked that question. I remember when I finished my uh, my second master's degree, and I was working in private industry and uh, working for the IBM Corporation. My mother said to me, uh, uh, how's your career? And I said, well, I think I'm going to change careers. I was almost 30 years of age. I was a volunteer firefighter. I said, I think I'm going to join Cincinnati's fire department. I was almost 30 when I did. She said, oh, Billy, with all that education, all you want to do is be a fireman. It was looked down upon as more of a blue collar. And, and granted, the only academic requirements were a high school diploma or a GED at the time. That's all changed since then. It's becoming a more noble profession. The knowledge base needed, whether it's through training or education is, is growing so that I think the fire department is more noble profession. So my question to, to the audience would be, would you be willing to encourage your son or daughter to, to pursue a career in the emergency services fire slash EMT, fire slash paramedic in this day and age? And, uh, and if so, what would be the motivation? Why, because of the service to the community or would it be because you perceive it as a more noble calling than it maybe was when I started my career almost uh, 50 years ago? And that was Bill Kramer. Uh, you. Bill also works with Ryan Menges, and there'll be links to the show notes if you want to see more about that. But Ryan also has been a repeated guest that's talked about space, aerospace, you name it. We, we talk about a lot of stuff together. So uh, if you like this, check out my website, learningable.com, and then check out their website, aerospace.com or A-R-S-I-S-P-A-C-E.com. All right. Thanks, everybody. I hope you have a great day.